Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Talking Nerdy with Ruff. This is the 33% and this is episode 3. Today I'm going to be talking about a show and maybe a couple movies, either one or two. I've got two picked out but we'll see how long it takes us. Um, the first show I'm going to talk about is Stranger Things. I've had a few people ask me about it and uh, I wanted to go over it with y'all. I'm going to read from a wiki page and I'll tell y'all a little bit about it, what I think about it. Stranger Things is an American science fiction horror web television series created, written, and directed by the Duffer Brothers. They served as executive producers. First season was released in 2016. It's set in the fictional town of Hawkins, Indiana in the 1980s. First season focuses on the investigations of the disappearance of a young boy amid supernatural events occurring around the town, including the appearance of a girl with psychokinetic abilities who helped the missing boy's friends in their own search. Second season, titled Stranger Things 2, is set a year after the first and deals with the attempts of the characters to return to normal and consequences that linger from the first season. Okay, there's going to be another series, and it says Netflix ordered the third season, and it will consist of eight episodes. First two seasons is nine episodes. It's got one owner writer is the I, I get them mixed up, but the kid that goes missing's mother, and it's got a really great cast. Most of the kids, I don't think, had really done much before this. So it starts out, it's four friends, four boys, and they're playing D&D, &D, and they, uh, they're they in a dungeon, I think, wherever they're at. They're like, oh, I hope it's not Demogorgon, I hope it's, and it, it's a Demogorgon. And it ends with a Demogorgon. If any of y'all, I don't know how many of y'all play D&D, &D, and, uh, it's a pretty big baddie in the D&D world. And it ends up that this, uh, like, chemical company is doing research. I'm not, I'm not sure that they're a chemical company. But this company's doing research. It's like government-funded research, and it's into this other world that mirrors ours. It's called the Upside Down. And in the Upside Down, you're, again, I'm kind of foggy on It's been a little while since I watched it. But the Upside Down, it's like you're, fears become reality so there's a demigorgon and in the second season there's a I don't think it's ever really shown but it's like it's huge uh, it's like the almost like the thing in Cloverfield and in the second season the one kid gets a little like tadpole thing names him Dart and it turns out to be a baby demigorgon the show when it first came out uh, I watched it pretty quickly when it came on uh, Netflix because it was it was set in the 80s, and I knew it was about D&D, &D, or, you know, had some, had D&D &D involved in it, and I watched it pretty quickly after it came on Netflix, and, I man, I really enjoyed it. The, it was, uh, it didn't even take the whole first episode for me to be really into it and see, you know, what happens next, but it is one of those shows that the more you watch it, the more questions there are that's not really answered, and... It's a it's a definite watch in my opinion. If you have you know, it's I think eighteen episodes. So if you just got a couple of days, you're not doing nothing. You got access to Netflix. Check it out for sure. It's uh, I really can't say enough about how much I enjoyed it. And most, unless you guys don't like it, if you guys want me to review stuff, I hate it. I will, but I'm gonna try to just review stuff that I'm positive about. But I'm not against. You know, stuff, reviewing stuff I didn't like, but I think it'd be a more enjoyable video if I just review stuff that I enjoyed. The next one is a movie that I watched. This one, I don't think I watched it. I might have watched it in theaters. It's a Quentin Tarantino movie, and it come. It was his first movie after Django, I believe. I'm pretty sure. It's a 2015 American Western film written and directed by Quentin Tarantino. It's got Samuel L. Jackson, Kurt Russell, Jason, Jennifer Jason Lee, Walton Goggins, Demian Bichur, Tim Roth, Michael Madsen, and Bruce Dern as eight strangers who seek refuge from a blizzard in a stagecoach stopover sometime after the American Civil War. This is a, it's an ensemble movie, but most ensemble movies are comedies. This is not a comedy. It's got a few funny moments, but it's a pretty serious movie. And it's a western, which uh, most westerns I like. I don't really gravitate towards westerns, 
but if I give them a chance, usually I, I, I generally enjoy them. And Hateful Eight, I really enjoy. Samuel Jackson <coughs> plays a great part as always, and Kurt Russell plays an amazing part. And uh, it turns out that they're... Uh, I don't want to read the whole thing to y'all, but one of them is a black guy, and he's in the South, Quentin Tarantino, or not Quentin, Samuel Jackson, obviously. And Chris Mannix is traveling to Red Rock because the town's new sheriff, and he's, that's Walton Goggins. I love Walton Goggins. I liked him uh, the first I knew about Walton Goggins was in Sons of Anarchy when he played Venus. And everybody was like, man, I can't believe that's Walton Goggins. You know, that's... I can't remember the character's name in Justified, but it was a long time before I watched Justified, so I didn't really know all about that character. Boyd Crowder was his name, and he plays Justified is one of my favorite shows. I almost reviewed it tonight, and I was like, well, I don't want to, I didn't want to review three shows that I just loved, because I was like, well, Breaking Bad, and I was like, no, I don't want to do Breaking Bad because it's such a such a long series. I was like, why well, do Justified? It's just as long. And Stranger Things is not as long, and it's a fairly new series, so it'll be easy for people to jump into. The rest of them, uh, Sons of Anarchy, Justified, Breaking Bad, How I Met Your Mother, those are all complete series that you'd have to buy a lot of them or find them on a streaming site. And I don't think Netflix has got all of them. I think Sons of Anarchy is on Netflix right now. But anyways, back to what we was talking about. They uh, end up, eventually... All eight of these people are in, it's a snowstorm, and they're in like a general store that's a stop along the route, and they're all, it's a lot of clashing personalities, and it's a really good, really good watch, really fun, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of good, good moments. Kurt Russell destroyed a priceless guitar in it that he didn't know was a priceless guitar. I've seen that in the, the outtakes when I bought the D, or the, Special features when I bought the DVD. The, he, he's playing a Martin that they had on loan from Martin's Museum. And he just, you know, went off script and smashed it. And it was this priceless Martin, like the only one in, known in existence. And it was in the Martin, Martin Museum. He just destroyed it. Anyways, it's a really, it's a good show, good movie. It it's a pretty quick watch. If you don't like Quentin Tarantino, I wouldn't check it out. It's not a... I don't know. Some people don't like his directing. I, I personally enjoy it. I, I don't think I've watched all his movies, but every one of them that I've watched that he directed, I didn't enjoy. The next one is... Uh, it's going to be changing gears a little bit, and I usually... Or, well, I hadn't so far. So I usually... This is only the third episode, so anything still can happen. But I hadn't reviewed a romantic comedy yet. But I'm a really big fan of romantic comedies. And this one is my absolute favorite. With the next favorite being Fool's Gold. I'll, Matthew McConaughey is a great actor in everything he does. But I, I like him in the goofy romantic comedies. Especially that one where he's this absent-minded treasure hunter that stumbles on this huge treasure. and It's, it's a good watch too. I'll review it sometime later. This is definitely Maybe, and it was written and directed by Adam Brooks. It's got Ryan Reynolds as the main character, character Isla Fisher, Rachel Weiss, Elizabeth Banks, Abigail Breslin, and Kevin Klein. It was set in New York City during the 90s, and it's about a political consultant who tries to help his 11-year daughter understand his impending divorce by telling her the story of his past romantic relationships and how he ended up marrying her mother. Now... I, this is another, I don't know if everybody likes romantic comedies. I do. I, I enjoy them, generally. Uh, there's some that I don't, obviously, but, but generally a romantic comedy is a good, it's a good, it'll be a good story, you know, and it'll have a nice, happy ending and everything's wrapped up, and I like that, you know, I like I like the happy ending, I like when the guy ends up with a girl, and, you know, the guy down on his luck, and he... Ryan Reynolds' character really screws up. He's Will Hayes is his name in the movie, and he's a 38-year-old in the middle of a divorce. His daughter, after after her first ex, sex ed class, she's 10 years old, her name's Maya, she insists on hearing the story of how her parents met. So he decides, he's like, okay, I'll tell you the story, but I'm going to change all the names so you won't know who's who. 
and it you know creates this little mystery and it leaves her guessing the whole time which one will turn out to be her mom and at the very beginning of it will is this he's a political guy he's i think he's working on a campaign i believe for clinton yeah for clinton and uh, he moved away from Wisconsin, where his college sweetheart Emily, with her. And um, no, he moves away. She stayed there. Yeah, she stayed there. And he works on the Clinton campaign. Over the years, he becomes involved with three other women who in his life include Summer Hartley, an aspiring journalist, and April, the copy girl for the campaign. Will and April have a chance meeting outside of work. Or Will, Will reveals he's going to propose to Emily when Will practices his proposal. Emily on April, she's taken back by Will's wholehearted words and replies, definitely, maybe. They go back to her apartment where April has multiple copies of Jane, Jane Eyre in her collection, explaining that her father gave her a copy with an inscription in the front shortly before he died. The book was later lost. She has spent years looking through copies of Jane Eyre in secondhand stores, hoping to find the copy her father gave her, but she buys any copy she finds that has an inscription. They kiss, but Will abruptly stops and leaves. Okay, the the uh, inscription thing. People writing books, and uh, especially when they're gifts. And I buy a lot of books, especially uh, hardcover Grisham books. And I'm trying to complete my collection. I, I've always read Grisham, and I've got a lot of them that's uh, paperback, and I've got some that's audio books. I listen to a lot of audio books, obviously. And I'd like to eventually have, you know, the whole, all of Grisham's work in first edition hardback. And I just bought one. I can't remember if it was the Testament. I think it was the Testament. I bought one, and uh, I didn't look at it. I just flipped it over and made sure it was the first copy, first edition. And uh, it says, to, to somebody, happy Valentine's love, somebody else. And that's so sad, because... You know, she obviously sold it and whatever whatever the story behind that is, whether, you know, your mind can wander as much as you want to. Maybe they fell in love, was in love for years. Maybe they still are and they were just downsizing their book collection. Maybe it only lasted till that Valentine's Day and she broke up with him and she was stuck with this book that she didn't want. I don't know, it kind of strikes home. But anyways, back to the story. Emily comes back to New York where she confesses just after Will proposes that she slept with his roommate. Emily slept with a roommate while he was gone to New York. She did it on purpose to break up with Will, saying that she's letting him go because she does not share his passion and ambitions. After Clinton is elected, Will opens a campaigning business with his most, most of his work colleagues, which enjoys a good amount of success. Before he leaves Wisconsin, Emily asks Will to deliver a package to her former roommate, Summer Hartley, who is living in New York City. Will first meets Summer when he gives her the package, a diary that she wrote when she was a teenager, which, among other things, tells of her brief, brief affair with Emily. And, of course, Will and his buddy reads it. Like, what, what are you guys thinking? You don't read a woman's diary. Especially, this is not a woman he even knows. Okay, his girlfriend back in Wisconsin, he's in New York now, and this summer he's going to be in New York, and all he knows about her now is what's in this diary. Her innermost thoughts when she was a teenager. Don't read a woman's diary like it's like going through a woman's purse or a man's lunchbox. <coughs> he finds she's going out with a famous writer who is old enough to be her father. The writer breaks up with Summer and Will starts a relationship with her. April quits her job and leaves to travel the world. When she returns, she plans to tell Will that she loves him, but discovers that he's planning to, pro to propose marriage to Summer. April half-heartedly congratulates him instead. Summer writes an offensive article about one of Will's clients. Will cannot forgive this conflict of interest, and he ends his relationship with Summer. As a result of the article, Will loses his business and his dream of a political career ends, with all of his friends abandoning him. Okay, so April is Isla Fisher, who's a gorgeous uh, redheaded woman, and she comes back like she's traveled all over, and it don't it leaves out in here. They have corresponded the whole time, like they'll write letters back and forth, and she ends up calling him while he's at the uh, I believe he's at the jewelry store picking out the diamond or something and she's like I see you you know it's real creepy kind of and he figures out who it is and it's this great meeting and could have been a great happy ending if you know I wrote the book 
but that's not what happened. It and he breaks up with Summer, and it uh, really throws him into kind of a depressed, out of his. He's not really into anything. He's just kind of living um, somewhat of a life, just barely getting by, <clears throat> drinking a lot and leftover food everywhere. It's a really good movie. Um, the summer thing was heartbreaking because they had a great relationship as well. If she wouldn't have wrote the article, which the the guy that she was dating to begin with told her, like, you know, don't write a fluff piece. It's not fair. You, you're a... You're a writer first. Don't don't just write a fluff piece because you're in love with this guy. You know, what are you doing? What are you doing to yourself? And I understand the principle behind that, but she could have just as easily not wrote an article at all about it instead of writing this hatchet job, is what I think they call it in the movie, and it's a pretty bad, pretty bad article. It causes the guy to lose the election. And <clears throat> anyways, April calls after a long absence and finds that Will has a new job but is despondent and depressed. Feelings further exacerbated when she reveals she has a new boyfriend named Kevin. She throws a birthday party for him, reuniting him with his old colleague, colleagues. Will gets drunk and confesses he loves April when she tells him he should have told her when he had his life together. He starts an argument with her when he implies that she is w wasting her life working in a bookstore. Sometime later, Will passes a used bookstore and finds the copy of Jane Eyre that April has been seeking with a note from her father. Will goes to April's apartment to give her the book, but he decides against it when he meets Kevin, who is now living with her. That look, yeah, it's so much more in depth when you watch it. He's got a new job, but like I said, he's all depressed. And he's living in a small apartment. There are leftover food everywhere. And she's, she's throwing him this surprise party with all his friends. These guys, you know, guys that he ain't talked to since the big breakup with Summer because that dissolved a lot of those friendships or for the time and for the foreseeable future because there's a quote in the in how i met your mother it's season nine i think episode 21 it's one of the last few episodes and ted's Mo ted mosby says it and he's like it's a uh, oh what is that guy's name it's where it's gary blauman and gary blauman was leaving the wedding because it goes through the whole thing Gary Blauman shows up, and um, Barney hates. He's like, man, I hate Gary Blauman. Ted's like, man, I hate Gary Blauman. Robin's like, or not Robin, uh, Redhead Lily. So I love Gary Blauman. She taught me out of the Sugar Ray tattoo, and she ended up with just a butterfly on her shoulder. And it goes back and forth. And anyways, it ends up Barney tells Gary Blauman to leave. And it says, and just like that, friends, just like that, kids, friends, acquainting this acquaintances, drinking buddies, partners in crimes, the people who you loved your whole life can be gone. It's so easy to say goodbye as you get older and and it be goodbye, you know, where you don't see people anymore. And I mean, it, I, that meant a lot at the time, but, you know, growing older and seeing people that you used to know and used to really be a part of your life and you really don't have anything to do with anymore, you know, it kind of strikes home. And that's, that, this scene kind of remind, reminded me of that it just popped in my head anyways he goes and he gets drunk and he tells her you know he's all in love with her and kisses her well he's there's been two times that April was all into him and he was in love with another girl when he proposed to the first girl and she's you know they kissed but they were still kids then and then when he's about to propose to Summer and she's going to tell her that she loved him but she didn't want to be the Debbie Downer and, you know, mess with his head. It would have been better off. Now, the book thing. This is this is a sucky move on his part. So he found this book that this girl's been looking for all her life because it's got this... I forgot how she lost it or ended up not with it, but it's got this inscription from her dad in it. He finds it. He goes to give it, which is what the right thing to do you know it wouldn't matter how mad she was at you how much she hated you which i don't think is really what was going on at this time but you'd want her to have it you know because it means so much to her and you've given it back to her means so much to her and he didn't because kevin answered the door anyways emily moved to new york city and she and will rekindled their relationship after running at a party at summers where they both were attending 
Maya correctly guesses that Emily is her mother. Maya states that it's unfortunate that the story has a sad ending, but Will explains that the story has a happy ending. Maya, you know, the little girl, because that's what you want if you had a daughter. And, you know, this is a really messed up situation. He's going through a divorce, and he's trying to explain to her how he met her mother and how they was in love, and it just, just didn't work out. And she's like, you know, she wanted her daddy to be happy. So Will decides to bring a copy of Jane Airy to April. While catching up, it is revealed that they are now both single, among other things. When given April the book, Will apologizes for waiting so long to do so. And a hurt April asks him, well, of course she's hurt. You know, she's, she's searched for years. And this guy screwed around with her feelings for so long. He's, he's in love with another girl. He's in love with another girl. Now he's drunk and he screwed up his whole life. Now he's in love with her. And then... You know, he finds this book that she absolutely has been searching for and loves and wants more than anything. And he keeps it from her for a few years. Well, Maya is like 10 at the time, and it was before her, him and April got back together. So, you're looking at least 11 or 12 years, and I think it's longer than that in the story. It's quite a while. Maya is happy to have figured out the story, but she realizes that her father will never love her mother romantically again because he still loves April. She figures this out by the way he talks about her in the story and that while he changes her mother's name from Sarah to Emily and talks to Summer, he keeps April's name the same. Smart kid. Maya makes Will have an epiphany, realizing that he's miserable without April and has loved her all along since the moment he met her. They go to April's apartment Will talks to her over the speaker just as Will and Maya begin to walk away since April stopped responding. Where he goes? And didn't let Will in the building. April runs out and asks what story Maya was talking about. Will tells April that he kept Jane Erie because it was the only thing he had left of her. Revealing in doing so that he still loves her. April hugs Will as she forgives him. And then walks hand in hand with Maya into her building. And hears the story as Maya walks upstairs. April embraces Will. Subsequently revealing that she loves him too. And they kiss. Okay. Now. It is a, that is a happy ending. And, you know, a lot of y'all know I'm a huge Truckers fan. And the secret to a happy end is no one to roll the credits. That's always the secret. Because in every movie, you don't know what else goes on. You know, like right there, that's the end of the movie. So you don't get to see the the fights. and Because it's it will be, you know. And like a... Poor Forest, you know, the secret to a happy end is no one to roll the credit. You could have ended that movie so many times and it been a happy ending. And it was. It's it's a good movie too, but you know, Jenny died. Jenny had cancer. And he had to raise little Forest alone. But uh anyways, it's this is a really good really good movie. It's one of my favorites. I watch it once probably every six months. And it's opening weekend the field cleared its production budget of seven million by grossing nine point eight million in two thousand two hundred and four theaters in the United States United States of Canada, ranking number five at the box office. As of September twenty eighth, two thousand eight, the film has grossed fifty five million four hundred forty seven thousand nine hundred and sixty eight worldwide. It was released on D V D in two thousand eight Rides, widescreen transfer to lead scenes, two short featurettes, and a commentary track. And it's got Ryan Reynolds. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes, 71% of critics gave the few the film positive reviews based on 144 reviews. Average rating 6.5 out of 10. It's a refreshing, refreshing entry into the romantic comedy genre. 59 out of 100 based on 30 reviews. I enjoyed it, and it scored over 50%, so that's that's good in Rotten Tomatoes. 71% of critics, that's a really good, really big hit for that. Hey, White, see how it done. And don't say. 
box office. It grossed 54.1 million in the U.S. and Canada, 101.6 million in other countries for a worldwide gross of 155.7 million against a budget of 44 million. That's pretty good. Film opening in the U.S. with a limited release and over the weekend grossed 4.9 million in 100 theaters. It's 10th at the box office. Anyways, it's got 7.3 out of 10, 74%. So it's a pretty good one too. Anyways, guys, that's it for episode 3. Hope y'all enjoyed it. Check out Sandman. Check out Hate Wait. Check out Definitely Maybe. Uh, as always, thank you everybody for taking the time out of your day to listen to my video. Watch it. Had a good time talking to y'all. Like, share, and subscribe. See y'all soon.